The first indication that the two hemispheres differ from one another is that they have clear physical disparities. These structural differences likely forecast psychological differences. For example, the left hemisphere is, on average, larger than the right. Both Broca's area and Wernicke's area, portions of the left hemisphere which are needed for speech production and comprehension respectively, are much larger on the left than the corresponding regions on the right. In general, the size of a region is related to how much we use its corresponding function. For example, a study showed that London taxi drivers often have larger right posterior hippocampi, since this area is associated with the storage of our complex three-dimensional maps. This might explain why the left hemisphere is, in general, larger in humans, since we use language very frequently. But we also have to realize that these differences may be inherent, especially since many of the differences between the hemispheres can be found in other animals. What this implies is that the hemispheres are not different because of language, but rather that language co-opted functions which were already present. It seems like our higher functions, the parts of the brain that distinguish us from other animals, are built upon a more fundamental innate system. What is the nature of this system? In order to understand this, we will need to take a closer look at how the hemispheres are connected to one another. The major connection between the hemispheres is the corpus callosum, and for a while it was believed to be nothing but a support structure, until it was discovered to be involved in communicating between the hemispheres. It contains between 300 and 800 million fibers, which connect corresponding areas between the hemispheres. However, a large percentage of these neurons are actually inhibitory rather than excitatory. We normally think of neurons as sending signals to other neurons, which then causes them to fire. By firing, I mean simply that the neuron electrically conducts a signal, and when this signal reaches the end of a neuron, neurotransmitters are released so that the signal is sent to the next neuron. Many neurons use the neurotransmitter glutamate, which tells the next neuron to continue conducting the signal. However, many neurons instead use GABA, which tells the subsequent neuron to stop firing, thus ceasing the signal. These are known as inhibitory neurons, and a large number of neurons in the corpus callosum are inhibitory, meaning that their function is to inhibit the other hemisphere. Contrary to how this sounds, uh, something like inhibition can actually be functionally permissive. So for example, if I want to reach an object, so for example this microphone, I have to first put my hand towards it and then stop and then grab it. Um, and if you didn't have inhibition in your brain, well, what would happen instead is that you would just kind of, your hand would just keep moving past, it wouldn't stop. Um, and you would kind of overshoot the target, so that's why inhibition can actually be functionally permissive. In fact, it seems that the main function of the corpus callosum is to inhibit rather than to permit, and so it can be thought of as a kind of organ in and of itself. As the brain becomes larger through evolution, one would expect the degree of connectedness between the hemispheres to increase, but in fact, the larger the brain, the less interconnected it is. Evolution seems to be moving in the direction of keeping the hemispheres as separated as possible, and even the corpus callosum seems to be getting smaller. This separation and lack of connectedness seems to serve a specific purpose, and that is of having two autonomous systems working in parallel. For example, it pays to have one system which is generally trusting of others, and another which is generally distrusting. Since either situation can arise, it makes sense to have both systems within your mind. The need for two parallel systems is clear when we think about the nature of attention. An animal needs to have a kind of precise, narrow attention, which allows it to hone in on a target, such as when a robin picks at a worm. However, at the same time, it needs to have its attention open to the environment, in case a predator shows up. Therefore, our minds need to accommodate two systems, which need to operate simultaneously and yet be kept distinct from one another, and we will call these open and narrow attention. If we think about this situation more closely, these types of attention reflect two attitudes. On the one hand, we need to focus on ourselves and on attaining resources for ourselves, as well as manipulating the world for our benefit. On the other, we need to be open to the external world, and see ourselves within the context of the world, to keep out for dangers, but also to interact with others in our social environments. The first requires that we be focused, the other that we be open, and these systems are accommodated for by the left and right hemispheres respectively. The left hemisphere is able to isolate an object from its context, in order to hone in on it, and use it, while the right hemisphere is open to the entire context, as McGillcrest writes. In general terms then, the left hemisphere yields narrow, focused attention, mainly for the purpose of getting and feeling. The right hemisphere yields a broad, vigilant attention, the purpose of which appears to be awareness of signals from the surroundings, especially of other creatures, who are potential predators or potential mates, foes or friends, and it is involved in the bonding of social animals. We can see this rather clearly in animals. For example, birds will turn their left eye towards predators, 
since this eye is connected to the hemisphere, which deals with open attention. If you see a bird in the wild, try going close to it. You will almost always notice that it will turn so that its left eye is facing you. Just think about how weird this is. It is like there are two birds, one that is focused on getting resources, and another that is constantly vigilant, that exist inside the body of a single bird. And if the wrong one detects the predator, it will switch to the other one, who is better suited for dealing with this type of information. But the right hemisphere isn't just preferred for dealing with predators, but also for social interactions. Toads will gather prey using the left hemisphere, but interact with other toads with the right hemisphere, facing their fellow toads with the left eye. For this reason, birds often gaze at their prospective partners with the left eye, right hemisphere, during courtship displays. And because the left hemisphere can narrow its focus, tool use is done in animals primarily with the left hemisphere. For example, crows preferentially use their right eye, left hemisphere, in tool use, probably because using tools has to do with focusing intently on a single object, while also manipulating it. Now these aren't merely two different types of attention, but two fundamentally different ways of looking at the world. Narrow attention basically isolates the objects of the world so that we can you know, hone in and focus on them. Um, and so it kind of removes and isolates those objects from their context. Whereas the right hemisphere and sort of open, the, the open attention that it provides uh, places things within their context and sees things within the broader context so that it sees the entire whole. However, the left hemisphere can also reconstruct the whole by kind of putting together these little pieces um, and gluing them together. Whereas the right kind of just sees the whole all together all at once without having to reconstruct everything. Um, now, understanding this fact is like stepping outside of the matrix. It means that your mind causes you to perceive the world in certain ways, which aren't exactly inherent to the world itself. Um, and so when at every act of attention, your mind adds a particular way of seeing the world, which isn't actually there. Um, even when we try to understand the brain itself, we're understanding the brain using systems, which are kind of pre we're predisposed to. Um, and so there's a sense in which we can't really understand the true nature of things because we're always adding something to the, to the act of attention. And that's an important thing to note, the fact that the type of attention we pay to an object fundamentally alters how we perceive that object. So if we come across a tree in the woods, we can either see it as just kind of this natural object, this naturally occurring phenomenon, or we could see it as a resource for us to extract and to, and to utilize. And so the type of attention we pay changes what we kind of see in the world. But it's not just that. It's also the fact that this attention and the nature of this attention changes us to an extent. It's, the relationship is reciprocal. Um, what we pay attention to, we modify with our own minds, but it also to an extent modifies us. However, left and right is not the only way in which the brain can be divided. We can also divide from top to bottom when we compare the frontal lobes to the lower, more primitive parts of the brain. The frontal lobes are what set humans apart since they are the most lately evolved parts of the brain. In dogs, they represent about 7% of the brain's volume, and in many monkey species, around 17%. However, in humans, the frontal lobes take up an astonishing 35% of the volume. It is these lobes which allow us to think in characteristically human ways. As McGilchrist writes, the defining features of the human condition can all be traced to our ability to stand back from the world, from ourselves, and from the immediacy of experience. This enables us to plan, to think flexibly and inventively, and, in brief, to take control of the world around us, rather than simply respond to it passively. This distance, this ability to rise above the world in which we live, has been made possible by the evolution of the frontal lobes. Analytically assessing the world in our minds is one thing, and is certainly powerful, but we also need to apply what we learn in our minds to the real world of actual experience. It is like an admiral scanning a map before planning an attack. He needs to put the plan first in his head, and then into action. If we live just in the world, we are like animals that respond moment to moment without reflection. But if all we do is reflect, we can't actually experience life, since we will always be in our minds rather than living in the world. We need to be able to bring our mental reflections back into the real world, if we are to make use of them. The frontal lobes are themselves, built out of structures which evolved long beforehand. And so the capacities of the left and right frontal lobes are shaped by the attentional capacities of their respective hemispheres lower down. To simplify this, we should expect the attitude of the left frontal lobe to have the qualities of narrow attention associated with it, and the attitude of the right frontal lobe should have a personality as though it were adapted to broad, vigilant attention of the lived, context-bound world. According to McGilchrist, this is exactly what we find in human brains. 
So it does seem that language, which again is a function of the, the left hemisphere and is relatively uh, recently developed, does have the characteristics of being narrow, since it confines our attention to kind of certain aspects of the world. And we can also think of language as kind of abstraction for, away from context. So if I say the word tree, I don't know why I keep bringing up trees as my example, but if I say the word tree, um, the word tree and sort of the actual object of a tree are kind of separate in that one is an abstraction of the other, um, and it's kind of isolated from context. It's not like a particular tree in a particular context, it's just like the abstract idea of the tree. And so in this sense, the language yields narrow focused attention. Um, language also allows you to carry out a very specific set of tasks. So like something, you know, instructions in language uh, allow you to do something very specific. So if, you're saying, well, if I say raise your left hand and then raise your right hand and then, and then grab your left hand with your right hand and then shake it, you know, it, it confines your attention to doing a very specific thing and kind of like everything else in the environment around you uh, melts away momentarily. And it's through language operating in the left hemisphere that we kind of produce a mental map for ourselves, a virtual map um, abstracted from context. The right hemisphere, by contrast, is always bound within context and so takes the world as it is as an impermanent, ever-changing experience, and attends to it in a non-linear fashion. This type of thinking is bound to the lived world of actual experience, since it takes the whole as its object, rather than abstracting it into parts. Since the world is always changing, the right hemisphere is better able to account for these changes, as opposed to the left hemisphere, which, through language, crystallizes around certain ideas, which it assumes to be permanent. In other words, the right hemisphere can accept ambiguity and change, whereas the left has a hard time accepting new perspectives. The fact that we live in two realities simultaneously is captured by McIlchrist, who writes, Hence, the brain has to attend to the world in two completely different ways, and in so doing, to bring two different worlds into being. In the one, we experience the live, complex, embodied world of individual, always unique beings, forever in flux, a net of interdependencies, forming and reforming wholes, a world in which we are deeply connected. In the other, we experience our experience in a special way, a represented version of it, now containing static, separable, bounded but essentially fragmented entities, grouped into classes, on which predictions can be based. This kind of attention isolates, fixes, and makes each thing explicit by bringing it under the spotlight of attention. In so doing, it renders things inert, mechanical, lifeless. But it also enables us for the first time to know and consequently to learn and to make things. This gives us power. Our brains provide us with two distinct and unequal worlds, and this has implications for how we perceive anything at all. In the next video, we will dig deeper into the nature of these two worlds in order to understand the fascinatingly complex nature of the human mind.